and I don't want you to concentrate too much on a lot of text because sometimes it's the author who speaks through the slides, but you'll see that my passion was to really grasp, first of all, what we're actually dealing with as a nation, and not just the country people. It's impacting on all of us, ultimately, as you'll see. And then the next part is, well, what are people trying to do with these feral camels? The last prediction was there should be 2 million by 2020, and we're in 2020. So, so it's in two parts. But what I want you to notice is two things. When you see the maps in a moment, how does the coastal urban population connect with this issue, which is visibly very internal, and who are the people that are responsible for dealing with it? And is it going to be management or eradication? Okay, so let's have a look. Right, so this is where the title comes from, and we'll talk more about this place. This is in the Docker River community in the northern part of Western Australia. Look at all those camels there, how they're herding and mobbing together for a drop of water. There's a tap dripping in this town. Those camels would have smelt that mile kilometres away, and they've come to get a drink. They're actually in the front yard of someone's property. Scary. Uh, so I've just put that there to where give myself some credibility in case you want to know who I am. <laughs> um, this is a map that was formed in 2019. It shows you the spread of feral camels in Australia. Um, it goes into four states, Western Australia, Northern Territory, South Australia, and Queensland. Now later on you'll see that there's a factor that's going to expand that red dot. Uh, I just added this map that more clearly shows the expansion of feral camels in Australia by state. Now, pre-1926, the point I simply want to make here is that the camels on this continent were all working, like they are in Arabia. They looked after their bread by the owners who worked them economically. That is before 1926. Oh, what happened there? My laptop went to sleep. Oh. Um, next thing, oh, so the next next thing is we are now looking at post-1926 when the government said to the Cavaliers, your camels are no longer economically viable, you can shoot them. And of course the Cavaliers had earned their living with working with their camels and they couldn't shoot them, so they let them go. Uh, some statistics to show you how serious I suppose this issue is. There's a prediction for 2020. The wonderful thing is that they're disease-free. And because they're disease-free, that has created a market for our camels in the Middle East especially. Uh, they rarely starve. They can feed on 80% or more of our native plant species. In fact, over there, when they first came here in 1866, the newspapers were fascinated by the fact that these camels are so cheap, they eat anything. And it was a time of celebration then. Um, they graze up to three point metres in height. So they eat grass, they eat bush, they'll eat the canopy of the short canopies of shorter trees. They've got a larger range than any other herbivore in Australia. They can siphon up water. And even when they haven't got water or food of their nature, the herds still reach up to 400. So therefore they will keep looking. Uh, they live up to 50 years, and in that 50 years, they breed for 30 years of their life. They can travel 70 kilometres a day. So that's sort of like going from here to Murray Bridge. For us, it's just one hour, but for them, they're actually eating the whole time. They're actually travelling. They, really, they range freely. Now, the thing is that they have no predators. There are no species in this country where there's a predator that can help to eat them up. And we haven't introduced a beetle that might help to <laughs> To affect their health, so thank God we haven't done that. So they can keep on breeding. The questions tonight are feral camels popular? Don't laugh. They are. We'll see. And can they be of any economic use like they used to be before 1926? And tonight there's camel milk over there for you to try later. If you do, you're supporting one of the economic uses of camels in, as perceived in this country. Um, but try it anyway. And how is technology and research helping us to manage them or eradicate them? This is a picture of a wandering herd of camels. It's hard to count them. 
You can see that land's denuded, so they just keep going. That picture was taken by a drone. So drone is a technology that is used to monitor the directions that they move in, but that's all drones do. You, they're, not, they're not used to count numbers, they're not used to look at the impact on water. They just simply are a, a, a technology tool that shows us where they migrate. This was taken in the goldfields in Western Australia. Now, I spoke to the Great Victoria, friends of the Great Victoria Desert, and they gave you some information. The map there shows you the location of the Great Victoria Desert. Very remote, not many people go there. They love to eat where there's no humans, the humans tend to shoot at them. So they like to go deeper into the bush. On the left hand side is an ecosystem that's hardly been broken down. Wonderful feed. Look at all that feed there. Three layers on it. Uh, now, it's not important to know all of the detail, but the Great Victoria Desert, like you are volunteers, and they actually go out to the Great Victoria Desert and they collect data for the government so the government can form an action plan. Uh, they use large scale aerial surveys. And they study especially very sensitive bioregions. So the concern that they have is that the high camel numbers may cause detrimental impacts on native vegetation and significant native biodiversity areas. What they saw from their survey is that camels go towards water. So they noticed that camels went close to lakes, uh, water points, and they go onto pastoral areas where they know or can smell permanent water. So there's a picture taken on the Great Victoria Desert. You can see that lush vegetation. Those camels are only looking at you for a second because they're going to be munching all of that down in about two or three days and then move on to the next spot. Um, so here you can see there's three camels to one plant. And look at the level of denudation they've caused and there's still, three camels are still eating that plant. Um, this is a picture of the camels on the dune fields area that was studied uh, in the Great Victoria Desert region where you can just see their numbers are growing. There is no way to contain those numbers and they're crossing those sand dunes and eating as they go. It's not a matter of knowing every single plant here. This is an idea of every species that they can consume. Of the 350 species we have in deserts, they eat 325. In my research to do with the Afghan cavaliers, I think I came across only three plants that can poison a camel. They can eat all the rest. Uh, so here's, I met, uh, when I was at the museum, I met an assistant to Andrew Harper, as you know, who's walked with camels across Australia. And that this young man said to me that camels prefer land, his language is unbroken. The plant cycles, the plant life cycles, the plant varieties are undamaged. And just imagine how much feed there is for camels. So if you see an area in the desert that's got a complete ecosystem, that's the best place for camels to go. Um, the impact on plant reproduction also, because they eat desert plants, they impact on their methods of reproduction. So they might swallow the seeds that would have established some more plants. They break down the suckers by which other plants tend to regenerate. They defoliate shrubs and trees. They break up mulga areas they have driven some tree species to extinction. And city people don't see this, there's never an issue when, you know, when we have election times. You never hear about, well, what are we going to do about the camels? Because the urban populations don't see it as a major issue, and politicians don't ride on it. Uh, the impact on native wildlife, this is beautiful, really. Native wildlife, camels will compete with native animals for native vegetation. Uh, the camels would destroy the trees and eat the grasses that birds and other insects and other animals need to survive. Uh, so numbers and species of native kangaroos, emus, small birds, reptiles can be threatened. Uh, so here's some t statistics on how they can siphon off the water. The red kangaroo is our largest native animal. It drinks 200 mils of water a day. The camel drinks 200 litres a day. And it's not even native. Uh, so look at these camels here. Not only do they go to the water to drink, they go in the centre of the water hole. So you can imagine their feet are stirring up the soil at the bottom of that water hole and consequently they are causing water turbidity which breaks down the very small animals that live in that water ecosystem. And also they loosen the soil which shifts into the water so there's a lot of desertification where they are. Um, here's another picture of them drinking. Uh, on the edge of that water hole, the, the water edges have collapsed, so the water has become lowered. So we lose a water hole in the desert, a water hole that was drunk by 
birds like this. So our native wildlife tend to drink on the edges of water sources and they tend to not consume a lot of water. Their bodies are designed for that. Um, this picture over here doesn't match the words, but look at that, those camels there. They're having a good wash and a good slush because they're hot. So they're destroying another water hole. But on the left-hand side, you can see the traditional owners of the Central Land Council, which is in Central Australia, were very worried about the impact of the camels on their water holes. So they asked the research scientists to set up sensor cameras and they watched the sorts of wildlife that came and um, drank on the edge of those water holes. And what did they learn from the cameras? That native animals can't get past the camels to get to the water and the camels will attack the native animals who try to drink at their own water holes. And um, yet kangaroos and birds drink a lot, a little, little amount compared to the camels. Uh, there's another research done. All those words are not so important so much as, again, it's indigenous people worried about the impact of camels on their water sources. This is in the Peterman Ranges in an area that's World Heritage listed. So our camels are destroying parts of Australia that are World Heritage listed. In this particular survey, they found out that actual sacred sites were being destroyed because the water sources were, the plants that were being destroyed are Aboriginal, Aboriginal bush tucker and bush medicine. That's quite significant in their experience. Uh, she also learnt, Dr Jane Brim Fox learnt, that the camels stay. They don't sit and go on. They stay and they stay and they stay till the water's gone. The edge of the water hole has collapsed. Then they move on. They will drain the water. They'll fail the water. And they will strip water holes of their features and cause further erosion. They disturb the sandy soils, which are fragile already. So I'll just move on now. Then there's the impact on indigenous communities themselves. Uh, so camels besiege Aboriginal communities. As soon as they spill water, they'll go to wherever that water is. It could be a water hole, it could be a dripping tap. They were attracted to the Docker River community because they smelt the water that was dripping from some leaking trap taps. And so they herded into the town. Then they found water in the air conditioners. So they started to tug the air conditioners to get the water. They broke down the town's water pipe, urinated in the water that was spilling. They urinated in that and they spoiled the wells. The residents became too scared to leave their homes. I mean, that's a moving herd. Uh, and then there's the impact on pastoral infrastructures. Camels move from desert areas to pastoral areas if that's where the water is going to be found. They break down fences and gates. So on one station, several hundred metres of fencing was lost. On another one, 140 kilometres of fences were lost. But camels then eat the feed, that's their native feed, but that native feed is designated by the pastoralists for their stock, their sheep and cattle. Uh, so damage, this is continuing along that line, so they destroy the water pipe and so I think the next picture shows the pastoralists trying to deal with that. So the pastoralists now have to spend some of their revenue on dealing with feral camels. Here's a group of camels that came to a water tank and would have got at that water tank until that made that water leak. But he came with his gun and that's an example of aerial culling or shooting. Uh, so climate change is impacting. Remember that first map I showed you with that big red splodge? Well, that's extending because camels will go to where there's moisture. And with climate change, our hot areas are expanding. And so they are moving towards areas where they can find water. So what happened, for example, this was in the newspaper in 2018, the, the land around Esperance, which is to the bottom of Western Australia towards the coast, is farmland, it's not direct desert, it's farming land, it's crops. And one day a farmer saw camels in his crops. It was a shock. That's that man there. They, they pushed down his fencing and his gates to get to his wheat crop. He'd never seen that before, but that's the impact of climate change. More and more, the camels are moving towards our post, uh, coastal areas. Uh, how else do we reduce the numbers? Well, you can't bait them because they don't stay still and you can't sterilise them. So shooting may be, may be the best way, maybe it's not the only way. Um, or is it a matter of managing their numbers and then using them to become more popular by making commercial uses of them? So. The point of view of the landholder is that they want camels, they will kill camels, but they also want to make a commercial use of them. So just what it was saying here is that 
it, there's a lot of money that goes with colour. You can see that Dr. Glenn Edwards per dot point, and you need four million dollars every year just to attack the numbers of camels. This is not eradication, this is management. But who should pay? Whose responsibility are they? The governments or the owners of the land? Um, now, this is a project that went on for four years. I remember this project. Lots of partnerships with different groups of people were involved, government and local landowners and Aboriginal people. In four years, they only killed 60,000 camels. 60,000 out of two million over four years. That's only 15,000 camels a year. And it costs millions of dollars. So it's not the, probably the most effective method. So the two methods of culling are the ground shooting that you saw and then aerial shooting. Now I just gave you here dot points to show you that culling goes on all the time. You might remember the media last year, there was a big, uh, big noise about the culling in South Australia. It was all over the media. People reacted emotionally, people reacted rationally. Uh, that's the third one down there. In five days, only 10,000 camels were killed. You know, it's really a concern that with all that money and energy going into culling camels in the outback, it only removes 10,000 from 2 million. And remember, they have no predator and they keep on reproducing. Uh, here's a picture here on the left is that government advert for that one uh, in 2009 to 13. They anticipated killing 1 million camels. Well, if they'd done that, they would have killed most of them. They didn't kill. One million, they only got 60,000. It was an ambitious aim. On the right hand side, you see the expense. They've got much of the wild camels into an area that's spent netted off. The um, helicopter there has got a sniper next to him. Uh, that's the same idea, just aerial mustering again. Uh, then they drive them to the yards, and in those yards, one of two things can happen. They can either be culled or they can actually be sent off for live meat, for live export. He, like other pastors, are saying, look, it's not just a matter of culling them, we can make money from them. Let's have canned meat export. Let's have live meat export. Um, so the obstacles, though, to culling is that it costs a lot of money. The helicopters and the shooters, the camels are still reproducing rapidly. The culling is failing to keep up with the birth rate of the camels. And the thing is that pastors actually don't want to continually cull. This, uh, Mr. Carmody says, it's madness to destroy the camel as a resource. They are organic, they're free range. And there's many of them, can't we make money from them? Uh, so this is uh, fencing. Now this is another method of trying to control how much area the camels uh, impact on. So uh, the, there's fencing that stops it from going into certain areas, but apparently not even the dog proof fence uh, is camel proof. Uh, keep coming so oh, the camels, the footprint. The, cam the camel has a high carbon footprint. That's been in our media a lot lately. Camels destroy, uh, they have a high carbon footprint. And they may also in the, in, inadvertently be adding to the drought situation. They're not only moved by the drought, but they're actually adding to the drought and expanding the area in which they have an impact. So culling still seems to be the answer. Now this is a landholder, uh, Mr Conway from Kings Creek Station. He does round up camels on his property. He likes to give some of the employment to the Aboriginal people there, but he also believes that his business from live camels is live camels or camel meat. Uh, so live camel exports, people think it's still happening. It, at one stage it was a way to earn money from camels, but you'll see, I think it says on the next slide that uh, Queensland was selling camels of all ages. Look how much money they got for a live camel at one stage. $950. And some of that goes back to the landowner. Uh, here's some camels who are being prepared for export to Thailand. They've been brought to the Darwin port. Uh, then they are being offloaded at Thailand. All this is expensive because to travel from Australia to Thailand is a lot of money. You've got to feed them and care for them on the ships. Um, and here are the Arabs who are very proud to say they will buy our live camels. They are a market for us because they're disease free. Uh, but we'll see how that might be a losing market pretty soon. Look at the infrastructure there, trucks with especially high sides being loaded onto aeroplanes. They're moving camels internationally now by aeroplane because ab camels find it less stressful. What they do is they clean out the cabin of the aeroplane and fill it up with camels. But they only put young camels there, not the big camels. So they select out the sizes of the, and the age of the camels. 
So it's, that's camels going off to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, obstacles, it's very long distance to take them from the interior of Australia to a port. They select numbers of camels and size of camels and age of camels. Um, so it's got limitations. Large camel export has limitations. And recently, that's uh, another picture of them being hoisted in Indonesia. That's another market. Uh, the other thing too is that camel meat requires, exports require suitable abattoirs. Peter Barrow has an abattoir and there's an abattoir in Queensland that we use. They're very far apart for a business that has to travel long distances to get the camel to the abattoir. Um, so this is just another picture of camels being loaded onto a truck. And then that truck will go from the Northern Territory to a Southern abattoir, which I suspect is Peter Barrow. Uh, this is Bond Station, just showing you the, in the infrastructure. Um, Sam Samex is a sole supplier of Australian camel meat. It once had its headquarters here in Adelaide near Sturt Street. There are, there's markets for it. There's markets for camel meat. Uh, and you can see there a range of countries that will buy some of our camel meat. But, but, but it's not like we're exporting. 50,000 camels were killed in one year to fill up our camel meat orders. It isn't that simple and it's not that cheap. Um, so we've got three Australian companies. Oh, I'll just go on to this. Yes, uh, Windy Hills Export Meat, Samix Meat. Um, yeah, Windy Hills. So these are exporting our camels. This is just the um, APY lands. They must have camels for meat. The actual people don't like to see culling that much. They don't want to see wasted bodies that lie as carcasses on their lands. So they load them up into trucks, um, get them out of their ecosystem, load them up onto trucks. Uh, put them in yards with high fences, water them, put them on trucks and then they're sent to abattoirs. So they make money out of canned meat. Um, but it has to be halal accredited. Um, and Samex, two feral camel abattoirs, which I've already mentioned. But the meat can be used for human consumption, but another way of using that meat is for pet food. Um, so there's some obstacles to that, which I've already said. High freight costs. But look at perceptions there, number three. Wild camel meat is different to farm domesticated camel meat. Farm camels are, uh, are quieter and easier to handle. Uh, I spoke to an Arab man in Sturt Street, Adelaide, some months ago, and he said that they don't eat feral camel meat, so they're not going to buy our feral camel meat. They prefer meat to domestic camels raised with affection. So that impacts on how many orders we get from the Arab countries. Um, I just want to move on a little bit. The anti-culling thing too. Aboriginal people don't like waste and degradation on their land. They don't want dead bodies lying on their land. But look at number two. Someone told me this and I checked that Aboriginal people believe that camels are sacred. Because when the missionaries went out to the Aboriginal people, they told them that three wise kings came on camels to visit baby Jesus in the manger. So some Aboriginal people don't believe in killing camels. Now, I did look for pictures of, to see if the Aboriginal people have taken the cattle into their dream time, and they have. Uh, that's just the size of a ship that was once moving live camels to the Arab countries. Uh, so there's raw meat. We've got another market in Australia. There's a lot of raw camel meat sold. Not so much in Adelaide. There's one store that sells raw camel meat in Adelaide, but in Sydney and Melbourne, a lot of our immigrant groups will eat um, this sort of camel meat. So there's a halal meat shop in Sydney, people from Ethiopia, Somalia, African countries, Arab countries, Lebanese, Syrians, Algerians, they'll buy camel meat because it is part of their cultural diet. Are you people prepared to give up lamb and start eating camel meat? If you do, you'll save this country. <laughs> uh, so here's a smart farmer. He uses brains. He said, right, well, I'm facing drought. I'm going to become bankrupt. I have to do something. I haven't got enough water for my stock and I've got camels to deal with. So he sold cattle. He bought that cafe in Kalamala and him and his wife started selling camel hamburgers. And people started eating them. So his philosophy is at the bottom. Maybe even other cattle properties did the same thing and sold camel meat. We could broaden the economic base of the pastoral industry. Um, now, camel milk's white gold. Uh, is there a market for Australian camel milk? might be in this room. Um, but just moving on here, camel milk has got a lot of value to it. I won't spend time on that. We can do that in question time if you like. So people have started setting up camel farms. 
camel farms in Perth, camel farms in Victoria, because I believe that because of the healthy value of camel milk, there is a market for it with people that have got allergies, uh, people that have got arthritis. Uh, here's the camel milk I first bought. Uh, the small bottles are $15 and the big litre bottles are $25. That one there is a litre $19. So it is an issue for the average Australian household, especially in these times where there's a lot of unemployment. Uh, camel milk is very expensive. Um, camel markets, there are milk markets for our camel milk overseas. People with cultural preference for camel milk, again, are in African countries and Middle Eastern countries. And our, that milk there can be frozen or turned into powder and exported. But imagine the infrastructure behind and how expensive it would be to export an amount of camel milk. Um, now, Arabs are a big market for us. Um, are they going to stay a big market for us? Why are they a big market? They look to us, our continent, for camels. They've got thousands over there. They look to us. Why? But if they improve theirs using our camels, well, then they stop looking to Australia and just dump us as a market. So let's have a look. They use camels over there. They add more economies to our camels because they like our camels for racing. Uh, they also like our camels for beauty and they also use embryo transfer as a way to improve the breeding of their camels. So let's just have a little look. Racing, we did start, we, export, we were exporting camels for a while as you can see up there to a lot of the Arab countries because they were using our camels for racing because our camels were disease free and very healthy and they would use our, our camels to breed in their camel racing stables. But after 2015, there's been no livestock exported. Could be because of the impact of breedings, you know, protesting against any live export of any creatures. Um, but they're also, then they started exporting them by aeroplanes, which means less camels were exported. Like a trans embryo. Now, because our camels are disease free and very good quality camels, there's now a business using technology where the embryo of a female camel is transferred to one of the camels of another country. So the camels can be sent to Australia and an embryo transplant conducted in this country with the other camels. Then they're taken back and then they're bred into the stock over in the Arab countries. Sounds fabulous, more money for us, but think about it. Camels travel by air. I was, I was amazed at this, that camels travel by air now to the Arab countries, not by ship. They're less stressed and that, you know. Um, camel embryos are wanted to expand the Arab camel's gene pool. So they're going to have better camels over there, then they can use their camels to breed better camels over there. They won't need our embryos for much longer. Uh, when you have a pregnant female camel, she will be absent from the race. It could cost you money. So then you would have an embryo transplant program happening in your stables. So are we actually working our way out of a market that was once very, very profitable for this country? And we were exporting our live camels at one stage. Uh, after all of this technology, is still trying to eradicate the camel. So camel, there's a new technology where they've taken a female in the outback, because camels don't stay in family groups like elephants do. And the, the females roam from mob to mob. So they put a collar on this female. It's, it's attached to satellites and GPS, and where she goes, the helicopter follows with the sniper. That's significant, you'll see in a moment. They, they'll collect the data on the locations or range areas of camels. They'll see their seasonal movement patterns. And after a while, when the battery goes flat, they've got to come down with a helicopter and get the collar off, and then they've got to put a new battery in the collar. And they'll continue following the camels. But the thing, the reason why is it called a Judas collar? Well, because this is what happens. You see in the front there, there's a camel with a Judas collar. The helicopter's following that camel because they can read where she's going through the GPS. She's gone into a new mob because the other mob got shot, but they didn't shoot her. So she's moved on to the other group of camels and now the sniper's going to go pop, 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 and then she'll go to another mob. So she's been trying every mob that she goes to. That's why it's called the Judas Collar. And how many camels are killed by that, I'm not so sure, but this is the impression of a person who thinks something must be done about this. This is an outback horror story. The plight of a camel wearing a Judas collar filmed, was filmed to portray the lonely fate of a radio tracked animal that brings death to any herd it joins. She made a silent movie. And in the movie, the camels are seen looking to the sky because they can hear the helicopter coming. 
and you can see the fear in their face. It's horrible, and then they get shot. <laughs> Sorry, but I'll be uh, so, it's back to you now. Here's a summary of all those choices you have available to you as Australians to control the numbers of cattle, or maybe their eradication, which is more likely. Would you prefer culling, aerial shooting, ground shooting, the use of the Judas collar? Uh, do you think we should keep up our live exports? Uh, after all, there is racing and beauty contests that need animals, or well, the embryo transfer might end that. There is a market for canned meat for sure. Is halal certified in Australia and is sent overseas? That is a genuine market. But again, what is the impact on the two million in the outback? Raw meat, there are people in Australia. It's an increasing domestic market. Eat, buying raw camel meat, you get it out later if you want it. In one of the stores, if you want to know the dress, I'll tell you after. Uh, camel milk is probably a market for it, but we don't make the same amounts as what they do in the Arab countries, and they're not going to uh, buy too much of ours. Um, well, who should pay for the removal of the camel? Should it be the landholder who's already struggling with drought? Uh, or should it be the government? Should this be a national coordinated plan like it once was in 2013? And uh, indigenous people don't really want, don't necessarily want them cold because they're sacred. Um, and of course the perceptions, you know, is the perception correct? Should we care and love the camel or should our perception be scientific based? So what are the dilemmas for the future? Is eradication an impossibility? Can we even use that word or is it just managing their numbers? Um, can they become popular again? Can we have diversified economies around feral camels? And how many of those economies are removing feral camels from the outback or are they breeding their own? Uh, embryo transfer means we could lose our biggest buyers, our biggest market. Um, environmental, environmental sustainability, biodiversity extension is possibly going to happen with many species of plants and animals because of the camels. Remember the 17 sustainable goals set up in Paris? The world was so excited. All these companies came together in Paris to talk about sustainable goals. And camels was one of them. Uh, amongst the wing of one of them. Climate change, they not only migrate further across our continent, but they contribute to drought. Um, they are not a high environmental, oh, it's not a high environmental issue for urban populations, especially at election time. Wild camels is never really much on the list of politicians. There isn't a coordinated national plan. Should there be a coordinated national plan? So to know you get the chance to support one of these economies around camels by tasting camel milk and then you're helping to deal with maybe reversing the problem we've got a commercial interest in camels as long as it's i don't know if it's from feral camels or domesticated camels if it's domesticated camels we're not really solving that problem of the impact of feral camels so i'll leave it up to you to try some camel milk thank you